Africa, Earth's second largest and second most populous continent. Its 12 million square miles account for 6% of the Earth's total surface area. Its more than 1 billion 200 million people account for 16% of the human race. I have had a two decade long fascination with Africa. It started in 1998 when I made my very first of many visits to the continent. I began in Southern Africa with trips to South Africa, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Botswana, followed by visits to Ghana, Senegal, the Gambia, and Liberia in West Africa, to Ethiopia, Kenya, Mozambique, and Tanzania in East Africa, and finally Egypt and Morocco in North Africa. During those visits, I became increasingly interested in governance and particularly what African leaders thought about the development of democracy on their continent. Nearly 20 years ago, I met my very first African leader. He was Samuel Nyoma, the founding president of the Republic of Namibia. I sat with him over lunch at the presidential palace, listening on a small transistor radio to a BBC broadcast about his own election results coming in that day. He was running for re-election to serve as president for a third term which was highly controversial because many of his fellow countrymen felt that he was violating the Constitution, which clearly allowed only two terms. The president told me that day that since he was winning by more than two thirds of the votes across the country anyway, showed that the people wanted him to stay in office for another term, regardless of how some interpreted the Constitution. Almost exactly 10 years after I met President Nyoma, I met with Joachim Chisano, second president of the Republic of Mozambique. At the time, he had become the former president and he had left office voluntarily after serving the remainder of the term of the first president who had died in a mysterious air crash and two full terms of his own. When party leaders went to Chisano and offered him a chance to run for office yet for a third term, he declined arguing that as a freedom fighter to bring independence to Mozambique, he was not interested in establishing a dictatorship. He told them that he planned to step down at the end of his second full term. Chisano and I met in his library in the capital of Maputo. I told him that I wanted to help my American students understand governance and democracy in Africa. Chisano told me that if I really wanted my students to understand democracy in Africa, I should bring them to Mozambique while elections were taking place the following year. So in 2009, I began doing precisely that, starting with national elections in Mozambique and continuing in several African countries over nearly a decade. During those years, I had a chance to talk again to Nyoma and Chisano, as well as many other African leaders, including the man who mounted the Mozambican civil war that resulted in the death of over a million people. I talked to African journalists, students, scholars, and ordinary citizens. My colleagues and I took our students to observe democracy on visits to Botswana, Ghana, Liberia, Namibia, and Mozambique, where I met with presidents and former presidents. We also went to Tanzania and the island of Zanzibar. Many of these visits occurred when actual elections were taking place. My real interest was to find out what Africans themselves, particularly the leaders, thought about how things were changing in African governance. The system of proportional representation was adopted for the legislative elections in order to give chance to the small parties to get seats in the parliament. We have learned of the challenges having to do with the dissemination of information and the education of the public. Uh, for a society that has not had too many elections over the years, and for a population that is not literate, voting is associated with, with people. Somebody is running for something and you put your support behind that person. It's personal driven. 
But here's a referendum on, on an issue, on an idea, not, not, not a man or a woman. Many observers outside of Africa are likely to think only of stereotypes they have had of Africa and Africans. That was true for the most part of my students. Before I took the course for African Democracy Project, the only experience I had, you know, about Northern Africa was National Geographic. You know, when I was little, I watched it on TV, so it was everything we just saw, you know, some of the ethnic groups of Africa, and then you also see commercials about Feed the Children. So you just have ideas of like extreme poverty with knowledge that there is a city and that they do have a political system, but mainly they just show the worst things about Africa. So you assume Africa is a country, not an entire continent, that's made up of 50 plus countries and that they're all the same, but I didn't really know anything to differentiate that from what I learned. As a person who is very interested in people politics, not just the in-depth um, course politics, I am really interested to see how people really feel about topics, not just the basic answers that we get from textbooks. I want to understand why people feel the way that they feel and get to know people better. Over the last five to six decades, the world has seen images of tribal conflicts in Kenya, Sudan, Somalia, Rwanda, and Darfur. At various periods over decades, they saw famine and starvation in Ethiopia, disease and health crises of Ebola, malaria, and other diseases in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And they heard about HIV AIDS virtually everywhere. There were wars in Sudan and Chad, domestic terrorism in Somalia and Nigeria. They saw civil wars, wars of secession in Nigeria, Mali and Ethiopia, military coups, state collapse like Somalia, and just general chaos at one time or another across the continent. These are the horror stories that many in America, including my students, carried in their minds every day from images in mass media and increasingly from social media. These become persistent stereotypes, and they carry over to the images we have of African leaders. But I sensed that my students began to see something most Americans could not see. Before they went on these visits, these students were no different from others who had never visited Africa. We will see that overwhelmingly after their visits, the students thought that African countries were truly trying to become democracies. I saw that when given even limited exposure to Africa, people's views changed drastically. Over centuries, Africa has evolved through various forms of governance. Pre-colonial Africa possessed perhaps as many as 10,000 different political entities. Beginning in the late 50s and early 60s, African states began to gain independence, either peacefully or following wars of liberations, rebellions, civil disobedience, or other actions. After independence, peace rarely followed. During the period from the early 1960s to the late 1980s, Africa had scores of coups and at least 13 presidential assassinations. There were more than 200 attempted coups and countless plots that never got launched. Borders and territorial disputes were also common, with the European imposed borders of many nations being widely contested through armed conflicts. Cold War conflicts between the United States and the former Soviet Union played a significant role. It was a world of alignment with one side or another. The superpowers played a game of you are either with us or you're against us. More recently, Chinese hegemony has increasingly concerned many African nations and their leaders on the continent. However, some African leaders seem particularly receptive to increased Chinese presence. Oh, all along, the Chinese people have been very friendly to the people of Africa. Even before colonialism and the white invasion of, the, of, of Asia and Africa, or, Really, there has been some, some, some commercial trade between the people of Asia uh, and Africa. So, uh, Chinese are friendly to African people. So when someone is coming to invest, when a Chinese is coming to invest from a country of 1.2 billion, with cities that are about uh, 18 million, if you take Ghana, Ghana is what? A slightly larger size than Lagos uh, State, you know, with uh, 24 million. So we need 
stability in West Africa. We need people to invest in West Africa. Over the centuries, wars and periods of starvation, political unrest, and liberation from colonial regimes have all led to a continent still in change, still developing, and still struggling, but nevertheless growing in their observance of good governance. A well-known Sudanese businessman, Mo Ibrahim, has said when you ask Europeans or Americans about African leaders, the first thing they mention are the bad apples. But there is another side. A diverse Africa which across its many cultures, history, and peoples is making tremendous progress in addressing its problems and its future. This is an Africa with leaders who are increasingly more sophisticated and prepared for leadership than we imagine in our world of African stereotypes. This is an Africa whose citizens have increasing expectations of their leaders. In order to provide objective measures of African democracy, in 2007, Mo Ibrahim initiated the development of the Index of African Governance. The key components of the index are safety and rule of law, participation and human rights, sustainable economic opportunity, and human development. Each of these components provides quantifiable measures of critical dimensions of governance. Citizen participation is but one of the elements of good governance in the index, but it is an important one because it measures citizens' ability to express themselves about their government and their leaders through the practice of elections and other forms of good citizenship. In addition to establishing the index, Ibrahim also established an award which would be given every year to a former African president who exemplified good governance in his leadership as president. The controversial award came with a significant cash gift to the former president that continued for the remainder of his or her life. As a result of his resolve to step down, which was unusual for an African leader, Joachim Shizano was the first African president recognized for achievement in African leadership by the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. The way we do things are all done in a democratic way. You don't have to say, it's democracy. You, you do democracy. You don't speak about democracy, you do democracy. According to the Ibrahim Committee, Mr. Chisano's decision not to seek a third presidential term reinforced Mozambique's democratic maturity and demonstrated that institutions and the democratic process were more important than the person. I was fortunate to meet and talk with four of five of the recipients of the Ibrahim Award for this documentary. Those Ibrahim recipients I met were Joachim Chisano, second president of Mozambique, Festus Muhai, third president of Botswana, Hive Kepunye Pahamba, second president of Namibia, Ellen Johnson, surly 24th president of Liberia, and first female president on the continent. This documentary is framed principally around these conversations and those with five other presidents, as well as other African students, activists, and some ordinary voters on their election day. In my discussion, I wanted to learn from them what are their hopes and dreams? Where do they think African democracy stands? What do they see as their nation's challenges? What do they think about corruption as an obstacle to good governance? And finally, are they optimistic for the future of democracy on the continent? Ghana is one of the countries that decided that democracy and people's participation was the answer. From about 1991, Justice Daniel Anand, dear Fanan, of blessed memory, who was um, our first Speaker of Parliament and had been a member of the PNDC, was tasked with the uh, responsibility of going around the country and asking Ghanaians, what kind of government do you want? And so we had what we call the National Commission for Democracy or something like that. And they went around the country and they presented their report. And the report said overwhelmingly that Ghanaians wanted to return to a multi-party democracy with all the pro uh, protection of freedoms of the citizens, free expression and all that. And so President Rawlings allowed a consultative assembly to be set up. Up to that point, any electoral process would have brought the elites back to come and draw up that constitution. So it was decided that it should be a consultative assembly where the people would be drawn from recognized groups. And so the TUC, the Butchers Association, the hairdressers, the automobile workers, everybody was asked to send representatives to the Constitutive Assembly. 
and they bequeathed unto this nation the best constitution we've had so far, which is the 1992 constitution. And the newspaper, like the Namibian, was deemed to be a communist infiltrated uh, opposition to the South African government. Uh, there was no freedom of the press. And the press was divided on color lines. There were the newspapers that were for the white population and the newspapers that were for the black. So. Apart from, from the armed struggle and, and the diplomatic struggle that was fought outside the country, we also had the struggle inside the country, which to a large extent was carried by the churches through the Council of Churches, but also through newspapers like the Namibian. And I think it built up a credibility of being critical and, and, and open and honest and that 25 years after independence, they are still critical. Well, I think uh, all along, Africa, Africa and its people have been, have been uh, practicing democracy. But uh, their democracy was violated by the forces of colonialism and, uh, and imperialism who invaded our continent and uh, colonized us. So democracy is not new to Africa. First, most African countries had to achieve independence before developing their own forms of democracy. Upon the arrival of the Europeans, self-governance in much of Africa ceased. The Berlin Conference, held in 1884 to 1885, was an important event in the political future of the continent. It was convened by King Leopold II of Belgium, and attended by the European powers that laid claim to African territories. It sought to bring an end to the scramble for Africa by the European powers. They set up the political divisions of the continent to suit their own interests to meet their economic needs back home. Imperial rule by Europeans would continue until after the conclusion of World War II, when almost all remaining colonial territories gradually obtained formal independence. Aujourd'hui victorieux, je vous salue au nom du gouvernement congolais. À vous tous, mes amis qui avez lutté sans relâche à nos côtés, je vous demande de faire de ce 30 juin 1960 une date illustre que vous garderez ineffaçablement gravée dans vos cœurs, une date dont vous enseignerez avec fierté la signification à vos enfants pour que ceux-ci, à leur tour, fassent connaître à leurs fils et à leurs petits-fils l'histoire glorieuse de notre lutte pour la liberté. Well, the biggest obstacle at present is that those who are in power, the minority, the minority is in power. They are like, uh, the, they are like one uh, riding on the back of a tiger. And they really want uh, uh, almost a watertight assurance before they get off the back of the tiger, because they feel if they get off the back of the tiger, it will eat them. We were a colonized country and we fought to liberate ourselves. The liberation was for us to bring democracy to Namibia, replacing the apartheid system in our country. Namibia is one of those countries which had to struggle 
wage a war for democracy. It took us about 21 years of armed struggle. That is after we have been at the UN petitioning, we even went to the International Court of Justice, the Liberia and Ethiopia, who were the only members of the League of Nations took the case on behalf of Africa. But using the technicality of Liberia and Ethiopia in a legal standing to bring the case to the court, the case was thrown out. So when that happened, uh, we have to either submit and accept the slavery or to stand up and fight. So in Dar es Salaam, a clarion call was made that we are our own liberators. We didn't expect the UN to free us. So we cross many rivers of blood until we achieve our independence. Africa contains 54 sovereign countries, most of which have borders that were drawn during the era of European colonialism. The vast majority of African states are republics. They operate under some form of governance involving a constitution, presidential rule, a legislature, and a judiciary. However, for the first 10 to 15 years following independence, few of them were able to sustain democratic governments uninterrupted and on a permanent basis, and many instead cycled through a series of coups, civil wars, tribal conflicts, or secessionist movements producing political instability in much of the continent. There is a new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. Democracy is not inborn. Democracy is cultural. In North Africa, we saw the Arab Spring which was an explosion of the love of freedom, of humanity. Democracy is where humanity devises a means to secure the freedom, to protect it, and to advance it, to govern itself, and to ensure law and order in the system. To a very large extent, once the opportunity is there for any party to contest the where there's free and fair elections, where there's level playing field, I don't see why there should be a military intervention now. Of course, the, the, those who are governing also have to make sure that they don't make the mistakes and repeat the mistakes of the past and take the people for granted. Democracy is really taking off uh, throughout Africa. We have now 30 um, functioning democracies at different levels of maturity, uh, but democracies nevertheless in which there are open societies where freedom of expression, freedom of choices are exercised, where there are regular peaceful transition of power. Um, but as I said, in different stages. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we're pleased that uh, Africa has come a long way as a result of two decades of reform in economic and social structures. One attempt to unify the continent around a common cause was partly the reason for the formation of the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, in 1963. After decades of working toward getting countries to cooperate with one another to build a stronger Africa, in 2002, the OAU formed and then launched a new organization, the African Union, or the AU. The founders' vision for the AU was that of a multi-member body of African countries that would help to create an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa, driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the global arena. AU is giving fantastic leadership to the continent as a whole. Uh, it's this AU at the beginning of this century that emphasized the need for Africa to open up using the building blocks of the regional groupings. It addressed it. It's this AU that also emphasized the critical role of the private sector. It's on this basis that it asked for partnerships, both from within and outside of Africa, 
uh, so Africa can leapfrog into the mainstream of globalization. And all the countries are now uh, adjusting to democratization, respect for human rights, respect for inclusiveness, and also improve the quality of life for their peoples. So AU is doing very well. I mean, when I look at the AU, yes. um, I get frustrated. There's a lot going on in Burundi. Nobody's mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. it. People are getting slaughtered. You see pictures of mass killings, etc., and a lot of you know brutality. You don't hear African leaders condemning that. They don't speak against it. You don't see the AU taking any action. You know, being mm -hmm. at the forefront mm -hmm. of anything. Then we say, oh, the international community and the media, and they're always focusing on the wrong things, and you know, nobody's paying attention to Burundi, et cetera, et cetera. But you're there. It's yeah. how many years after independence? Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. can't keep running to the West. I think it's just the responsibility of all uh, member states of the African Union mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that they educate their people, that they belong to the African continent, and this is what the, the, the youth should be brought about, mm -hmm. that they must work hard, they must uh, make sure that the United States of Africa is achieved in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. ECOWAS, on, on the other hand, I think is doing a bit more because with protocols like uh, the trade protocol that, uh, that right. allows for the free movement of goods, uh, the immigration protocols that, uh, that allow for the free movement of people across borders, you know, these are things that are affecting lives, that, that are affecting economies, that are affecting businesses, mm -hmm. you know, in the sub-region. So we, we begin to feel the effect of um, that regional group more than we, we feel the effect of the larger African Union. ECOWAS, which stands for Economic Community of West African States, was formed in 1975. There are 15 countries that share geopolitical and common economic interests. One of their goals is mainly to develop their economies through cooperation and integration. ECOWAS also plays a limited military role through joint forces from member countries, removing the need for non-African forces on the continent. It has aided in several peacekeeping missions in the Ivory Coast, Guinea-Bissau, Mali, and the Gambia. The Liberian civil war that killed more than 250,000 people was resolved in part by ECOWAS and the United Nations. I think that it was the first test that a continental sub-regional body could, you know, take direct intervention to try and stop, you know, fighting in another country. Now what it does <clears throat> is it shows that there's a collective interest in what happens in our individual countries. So rather than wait for a civil war to occur and send our soldiers to die, we said, look, let's make sure that there's more citizen participation. Yes. Let's make sure there's more democracy. Let's make sure there's more freedom of speech in every country so that we don't have to send our soldiers to go and die in any country. It's not just coincidental. I mean, that, that they've really done well because the leaders who formed it at the time, in the 70s when the uh, echo was started, you, you would reckon there was a lot of military dictators mm -hmm. around at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So it was easy for them. Protect your place, I protect mine, I don't interfere in your affairs. So it was a nice agreement. When I'm killing my people, you don't say anything. Mm -hmm. And to a large extent, that still remains. That's why the Gambia would do what it does, and most of our leaders would pay lip service to it. They would go there one, one time maybe to try and for the cameras say we're going to speak to Gambia about all these things. But then behind closed doors, only God knows what is said. Because you realize, like you mentioned, these dictators remain and still are members of these groupings. SADC is the Southern African Development Community, and its goal is similar to ECOWAS. It seeks to further socioeconomic cooperation and integration, as well as political and security cooperation of 16 Southern African countries. A similar organization, the East African Federation, comprising six countries, has been formed in East Africa. The EAF would be a more integrated federation than ECOWAS or SADC. 
These regional communities are evidence that African nations seek to play a greater role in governance on the continent, to provide for itself through cooperation, and to play a strategic role in its governance that outsiders played during its colonial and post-colonial past. We have to take history seriously. Liberia is uh, in the rising again. I would say it was through ECOWAS that peace was secured there, mainly through ECOWAS. I happen to have also had a hand. Mr. Taylor decided to step down. I was the chair of ECOWAS. And even since uh, he left and our sister Johnson Sirleaf assumed, assumed office and I was still in power, Ghana supported her in uh, restoring some of the basic things. After the Accra peace talks and, and uh, democracy returned in 2006, you might say in many ways Liberia was starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. You know, rebuilding the institutions, getting people back in places, being able to address the huge infrastructure destruction that existed. So it's, it's a tremendous task and sometimes uh, people forget when they try to compare Liberia uh, to Ghana or to some of the other West African countries, they forget this whole period of destruction where, where we have to overcome. The idea is to make sure we learn from those lessons of experience so that never again we can go back into a self-destructive situation and we can use what we have for the good of the country to make sure that every Liberian feels like they have a future that has prosperity within its reach. In addition to continental organizations and regional communities and federations, a few countries exert strong individual economic, political, and military power. South Africa, Nigeria, and Ghana play significant leadership roles on the continent in different ways. For example, Ghana is considered by citizens across the continent to have the strongest institutions, an independent judiciary, term-limited presidency over the executive branch, and a well-structured multi-party legislature. Illustrative of its stable democracy through strength of its institutions is the outcome of the 2012 presidential elections. The main opposition political party disputed the results and went to the Supreme Court against an independent National Election Commission. The incumbent, John Mahama, had been declared the winner with 50.7% of the vote, and his major opponent, Nana Akufo Addo, who had 47.7% of the votes, challenged the results in the Supreme Court. The winner had to clear a 50% threshold, which the Election Commission said Mahama had done. No election results have ever been challenged since Ghana put in place the 1992 Constitution, the nation's fourth. The dispute in the Supreme Court lasted until late August the following year, fully eight months after the results were declared by the Election Commission. The entire country was on edge as the drama played out in the Supreme Court on television every day. On August 29, 2013, the Supreme Court of the Republic of Ghana convened right here in this building to hand down its ruling. It observed that there had been some irregularities and malpractices in the conduct of the election. In a five to four decision, however, it reaffirmed that despite these shortcomings, the charges of the plaintiff were not sufficient to overturn the election of John Mahama as the president, as had been declared by the Election Commission. Okufo Addo and his party accepted the results and Mahama continued to govern and Ghana resumed normalcy. In the very next presidential election in 2016, Mahama and Okufo Addo met again. This time, Okufo Addo won in a landslide. I had been in the country with my American students for the 2012 election. The students had the opportunity to be observers of the election and the demonstrations during the days that followed. We were at the election commission when the results were announced. As election observers, we got to see how they vote and how they tabulate, and it was very refined and not something that I expected from a developing democracy. And we went around just asking people how long have you been waiting and some of them said since 10 p.m. the night before and so we're talking 16 hours and they're still waiting and they all say my vote counts I'm here because my vote counts my voice counts
my perception of democracy sort of when we went over there, it was very one-dimensional. There's no such thing as a 100% pure democracy and that that's what I learned in Botswana and it really made me come back here to the United States and see that, well, theirs isn't perfect, but ours isn't either. In the United States, we might not have the best knowledge towards Africa, and I think that it's a huge disservice for everyone. I think a lot of people in the United States have a preconceived notion of what Africa is like. I did not see the Namibian genocide um, in any history books, but I was very intrigued to learn there are a lot of parallels between the Holocaust that we just know about and the genocide that occurred in Namibia. Um, one thing I absolutely found fascinating was the amount of voter turnout that they have there. But they were just so adamant about voting and how important it was. You know, they had, I think it was something 80% voter turnout compared to the United States with the last election we had about 50% or even less than that. So I was amazed at just how much the people cared about their country. We're talking about a country that has had, you know, you could count on one hand the number of elections they've had since their inception. And so, you know, they are at a totally different level. It doesn't take away, though, from the fact that they are emerging as a democracy. But I think outside powers have to understand that the democracy in Liberia is not going to be something that can be measured or compared to developed countries right now. It's something that is a work in progress. But it's something that we have to leave to the people of Liberia to figure out what they want their democracy to look like, what, what they, the shape they want it to take. It's, it definitely cannot be something that is imposed on them. I think the NAC did a wonderful job. They had all of the material. I did not see anyone that did not get enough material or the correct material. Um, and the, all the poll workers were there, all six at every station that I was at. And um, just the organization that they had was very well done. Voter turnout across African countries have been high over the years, while the more industrialized countries of the West have seen very little change or an actual decline in overall turnout. When I brought my very first group of students to Africa for the very first time to observe an election, they were very excited, but they had low expectation. Then they saw the Africans' commitment to democracy. Oh, I'm supposed to do that? Yes, right. Yes. That's my girl. In talking to average citizens, I heard things like, we don't, you know, we like the help from the government. Um, we, we need the help. But we don't want to rely on the government for everything. We want to be self-sufficient. And again, that's, you know, coming from both sides, I, I found that very refreshing. I, you know, I, I think I just had this idea that multi-party elections were good, they represented the, the people, and that if this is what they were switching to, this would be a good thing for them. Um, I had no idea of the complicated, intricate details, naively so, I have to say. But I, you know, and as I learned more about it, I thought, this is really the global phenomenon. I also do believe that democracy should be a system in which different oppositions have equal chances of being a part of the electoral process and actually winning. And with Mozambique, for the past 30 years, they've had one political party in place. And for me, I thought to myself, is this really multi-party um, democracy or is it just dual party or one party, basically? And with Fulimo and Rinamo, it was dual party, and I was so glad that MDM did come into the picture this election to basically change things, and it did change things. It, it might not have changed with the presidency, but there was a shift in the political spectrum in the way Mozambicans regarded it, their democratic process, um, this election. The elections here were very fascinating. The biggest thing I noticed was probably the dedication and the passion. I mean, I noticed the lines were extremely long, which you don't really see in the United States. The people were going to the polls sometimes at 1, 2 in the morning, and they were waiting in lines that had hundreds of people just to cast their vote. They feel like it was their civic duty, and that's how important it was to them. And I don't see that in the United States with, uh, with a voter turnout sometimes of 50 to 60 percent, where here we are getting upwards of 75 percent to 80 percent. 
The level of interest in democracy in this country is something we talked about when we were in the States, but it's really amazing to see, and I think that was the thing that we had studied that was surprising to see here. Um, just going to the election uh, polls yesterday and watching the people standing in line and pouring rain, waiting to vote, the excitement about it, the, the, in, the fact that it was really a, a big process for everybody that they were involved in, um, all the news, the radio, it's all been about the election. So the interest in democracy has been something that, again, is, is unique in my experience. In my discussions, I wanted to learn from African presidents and other African leaders what were their hopes and dreams. In spite of frustrations and setbacks, leaders are for the most part hopeful and they aspire to have a greater role in world affairs as a united continent. While there are internal conflicts and disputes, there are currently no significant border wars since the secession of Eritrea from Ethiopia. For the most part, there is peace on the continent. When asked about peace in Liberia after the Civil War, Lima Gaboy stated, There is no joy in the joy of building peace with sisters. No one has experienced this joy until you form a movement like this one. It's sincere, it's genuine, there is no fakeness in it. It's all about Liberia. It's not about me right now. The song we sang, say, even if you beat me for peace, I'm satisfied. Yeah. Even if you are violent to me because I'm non-violently protesting peace, I'm satisfied. Yeah. Because for us, it's not about the politics of this country or the wealth of this country. All we want, each and every one of us, is to live in peace, grow all in peace, have our children in peace. And so today, the, their presence here is just to send a signal out to the Liberian people that tomorrow, this is the only thing that we want. Where do they think African democracy stands? African leaders are realistic in their assessment of progress on democracy in Africa. When asked about this, Johnson Sirleaf said, uh, When it comes to political institutions, uh, we, we have a functioning democracy in terms of uh, our politics, but has not reached a level of institutional maturity. So you have many strong political leaders, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, provide the guidance to lead for their institutions, mm -hmm. but their institutions depend largely on them and their, their strong influence, their strong authority. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're working on now. How do we institutionalize uh, the politics of Liberia so that it transcends any one strong influential mm -hmm. leader? Mm -hmm. To what extent has African countries shared governance with local authorities? African governance tend to be highly centralized, with much of local government controlled by the national administration. Stemming the tide of corruption and a monopoly on government funds that are not necessarily used in the citizens' best interest are the reasons decentralization of government and fiscal responsibilities have been encouraged by political activists. Governance are the components the transparency, the accountability, you know, the responsiveness, that accurate responsiveness, the responding to the actual needs of people happens better when the center is close to the ordinary people, as close to the ordinary people as possible. We don't have that right now because even though we have a decentralized system and we have a local government and all of that, first of all, they, they, they are not accountable to the people because see, they, they, are, they are pointing power <clears throat> elsewhere. No. But on the other hand, they, 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 they also get financing from the center. So really, what's, what, what is the motivation for the gentleman to, <laughs> to respond to the needs of the people? You don't do anything for him. Local government takes care of local activities. You know, there's something called decentralization. And... Uh, Local government has to interpret national policy. For example, sanitation. The whole country is engulfed in a sanitation problem. Then you have to localize it. So the, the local government that is made up of the district assemblies, uh, and then the, the municipal authorities, they handle those issues. And uh, this has supposed to be grassroots, uh, grassroots uh, uh, problems. But to have strong mayors uh, running the regions, you also need maturity at the top. So that whether 
I belong to the same party or not. Whatever belongs to that constituency or to that uh, district, I'm going to give it to them. You know, so uh, maybe we needed to go through this process, mature at the central government level, and then be able to say that you can be a mayor in Accra, you belong to the wrong political party, but still you participate at the national level when there are meetings so that your people will not feel once they've elected you and you belong to the opposition that they have to get rid of you in order to get the benefits that belong to you by virtue of being a district. Uh, decentralization is a, is a major priority of this government. Mm -hmm. uh, we started with what we call deconcentration mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we begin to push the determination of priorities, sure. the exercise of authority away from the center to the periphery. Um, in terms of fiscal matters, making sure allocations from our budget, mm -hmm. uh, rather than before all centralized uh, through decision making, they now go to our uh, political subdivisions for that. What do they see as their nation's challenges? Our economy is not throwing up enough jobs to be able to absorb them. We have young people finishing university and they can't find jobs. And that is why one of the major things we must focus on is to push for growth with jobs. Mozambique is a country that is rich. We have resource, good land for agriculture, timbers, um, even uh, this uh, coast um, that is rich of fishing, but Mozambique still be poorest because this government doesn't have good policies for development. African leaders are realistic about the challenges they face. They agree on education, health, youth unemployment, and restlessness. But what do they think about corruption? Corruption is the biggest ever threat. Look, if a, a, a system is corrupt, nobody thinks about the state. And when nobody thinks about the state, nothing goes on, even up to the courts. If corruption is rife in a country, people can buy their way through everything. And so the system doesn't work. And if corruption is in the country, there is another big problem. The bigger problem is that government doesn't have money. People have money. So nothing goes on. And then corruption brings indiscipline. If a population is indiscipline, you can count it. We go nowhere. So for me, for all that we are doing, and most of the corruption comes from our so-called, the people who praise us. Today in this country, foreigners bribe their way through everything. How come the Chinese are in this country so much and they are you know, digging everywhere? It's because people in authority brought them. The rumor is that MPs and ministers go for the concessions, they go to China, buy the equipment, bring the Chinese, come dig and get gold for me. That's corruption. I take corruption as a virus in the computer. It destroys everything. If corruption is a threat to democratization in Africa, then I would say it's equally a threat to the sustenance of, say, Western civilization or the emerging BRIC nations, including China. Corruption is decaying, and decay threatens all lives. In Africa, in general, um, we are still growing. I mean, compared to the advanced countries, we are getting there. But I hope someday you will not hear about any corrupt anything. And I'm trusting that we have dedicated and integrity, you know, leaders who will take our position. Well, in lots of areas, Botswana's, Botswana people are encouraged to start up businesses, basically do anything you could do in a democratic country. We do have cases of corruption here and there. I should think that such would be expected in any country, really. They are not in agreement and as willing to admit the role that corruption might be playing in holding back the advancement of democracy. I survived for as long as I did because of the golden rule, doing to others as you would wish them to do to you. Mm -hmm. I survived as long as I did because I was sensitive to the aspirations of our people. I survived as long as I did because I did not inflict my will on the people. I spent 30, 40% of my time actually watching out for corruptible things.
mm. and fighting corruption mm. because of the ease with which you know the climate is easily taken advantage of by people in authoritative in positions of authority you know and mind you i survived as long as i did because i did not abuse my office yes. I did not act with impunity. Mm -hmm. If you can give people a leadership of integrity, they would put up with any amount of pain mm -hmm. when they know you're not exploiting them. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at some data from the Ibrahim Foundation. In 2018, the index ranking for participation and human rights on a scale of 0 to 100 ranged from a low of 17.5 in Eritrea to a high of 77.2 in Mauritius. Ten African countries showed declines in participation scores, while 43 showed increases, several by more than 10 points. The consensus among Africans I talked to is that democracy in Africa is getting better. Their judgment is based mostly on the fact that elections take place and human rights are mostly respected. In many cases, the press is relatively unrestricted and talk radio is widespread and rambunctious. I would say Botswana is one of the relatively more, most democratic countries around in Africa, more so because we have free elections, free and fair elections that are uh, supervised or regulated by the IEC. That's the uh, the commission that's uh, yeah that's in charge of supervising such and you know everybody can vote people are actually encouraged to go out there and cast their votes they want uh, our government encourages people to choose a government that they're most comfortable with and that they would like you know they don't force anybody to do anything finally are these leaders optimistic for the future of democracy in africa in the end, democracy on the continent is struggling, but slowly improving against many obstacles. Leaders are hopeful, but realistic. My students saw this and expressed it best. It seems to me that they are struggling with exactly the same issues that the rest of us are. How to um, care for a population that is sick and, and potentially dying without a tremendous influx of resources. We debate about government involvement and healthcare and how we don't want our government to do this. We don't want our government to do that. In Botswana, we saw that the ARVs for people infected with HIV were provided for free because the state felt that it was its duty and responsibility to take upon such matters. So maybe we have it backwards. I was able to get a lot of hope from being in Ghana. That's the main thing I took with me. Ghanaians, they didn't feel like, oh, if my candidate doesn't win, I'm going to have a huge hissy fit. They were just like, you know, I want so-and-so to win, but if he doesn't win, it's okay. When it comes to the city life, it was very uh, shocking to me that South Africa had such a huge industrial and very uh, up-to-date modern uh, uh, economic uh, society. Coming here, I've learned so much more about its history, its people, and its culture. I don't see why there should be any reason that Mozambique cannot achieve the level of democracy that the U.S. has. It, it just needs some time. The Civil War occurred in the 1970s, um, and it just recently ended in the 90s, so it's, it's a brand new country. But I think that it will be achieved. I think it is going to take some time, and it's going to take a few lessons. Um, but they are going to find those individuals and those leaders that will take them towards their future. You know, I was surprised to see just how in love these people were with their country. Everybody kept saying it's all about Mama Liberia. And I thought that was such a powerful thing to think that there are people who are still so, you know, not just out there to, to get stuff for themselves, but they were thinking about the greater good of their country. I think that the initial impression is the resilience of the people. It's, it's absolutely amazing how people have developed a personality, I guess, that is so open to everybody. And uh, in there's, there's extremely strong political divisions, if you will, but there's no sense of violence or, or frustration or anger with any other political party people. People simply want, people simply want to express themselves, and, and they want the world to know. I think what they have done since the war ended. Are they optimistic for the future of democracy on the continent? 
Um, there are times when I'm very optimistic and I feel, look, we've got to make it work, even if we, we, the, there's little to look forward to, etc. I lived out of this country for 12 years. Yes. I came back with no intention of going anywhere. I still have the opportunity to go if I want sure. to. But for me, this is important. Yes. Project Ghana is important enough. I'm a great optimist in this regard. Uh, if you look across the continent, you find that more and more there are open societies. There are institutions that are requiring accountability on the part of their government. Um, there are more participation uh, by citizens. Um, they are regular free and fair elections. With the help of ICT, all over the country now, people know what's happening around the world. And uh, I believe people believe that uh, humanity is moving uh, into the era of people's power. And uh, that's democracy for me. Look, you cannot be a pessimist and be an African. Okay, uh, Africa is to be built on optimism.